So, uh, last one to talk about Spigelian, which. Um, okay, wait. Before we talk about Sp- Sp- whatever it's called, go back and make sure you're watching the last few minutes. Why? Well, because Mike totally screwed up his words. Not great with the English. Luckily, we added subtitles to translate, but you need to watch it. Then we're going to do this, whatever it's called, next time. And even more importantly, we're going to go way beyond diagnosis next time. We're going to answer the questions, is it incarcerated? Does all sound good for this? And what to do? In the meantime, if you want to learn this in person, go to castlefest2018.com and register to hang out with us in a castle while learning super dope ultrasound skills. Yes, you heard that right. You asked for a Spigelian hernia. Yes, you heard that right. You asked for a Spigelian hernia diagnosis episode, and you got it. All right, I was joking. There's some other stuff in here as well. Keep listening. I swear it gets better. Well, crap. I like to hang my hat. Just to be clear, though, like we've said a thousand times, ultrasound is a tool. It gives you information. You still have to be a doctor and use your clinical judgment. But having this tool... Looking directly at the bowel and integrating this information should make you a better clinician and improve your clinical judgment. Now, why am I not on the podcast videos and instead just making random comments at the beginning and the end of the episode? Is it because I'm lazy? Yes. Are there other reasons also? Well, yes. Recently, um, you know that castle? you're not good enough at ultrasound that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation get out there ultrasound some hearts some lungs some ivcs let us know how you feel about it yeah we can definitely do that or we could be better clinicians and use our ultrasound all right i was joking there's some other stuff in here as well keep listening i swear it gets better so uh last one to talk about spigelian which um is uh i've seen this spelled like seven different ways like in your slides i was kind of hoping you would notice that (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I couldn't remember how to spell it, so I just spelled There's it all so the different ways I could eyes. think of. <laughs> this one is maybe the most ridiculous. Uh, yeah, I couldn't remember how to spell it, so I just spelled it all the different ways I thought it could be spelled and figured I'd get it right at some point. So Spigelian is also <laughs> another hernia. I don't think you hernia. have yet. I'm not sure you have. <laughs> is another hernia that I've never actually diagnosed. This one's super easy because all you do is basically just have the patient Valsalva as you're tracking up along the lateral portion of the rectus. And if you can find the rectus on ultrasound, then you can find a Spigelian hernia, basically. Uh, and what you're looking for is this sort of um, this herniation, if you will, of the bowel right next to the rectus, in between the rectus and the um, the lateral abdominal muscles, the internal, external, and the transverse abdominus, right? So that's going to look something like this, uh, which is kind of hard to tell what's going on. The key here is definitely going to be, um, you know, Valsalva and comparison to the other side, right? Always nice trick whenever you've got uh, symmetry between two things. So here we've got left rectus, um, and then there's this structure here in between the rectus and the the lateral abdominal musculature. And I would see something like this. And if it wasn't pooching in and out with Valsalva, then I would compare this to the other side and say, hey, is this guy different than what I'm seeing on the other side? So that is Spigelian hernia. So maybe you didn't want to know how to diagnose all those hernias, Jacob, but now you know how to. The real question for me is, and I think the thing that's more clinically oriented here and more interesting is, is your hernia incarcerated? uh, And is it uh, in fact strangulated? And what do you do with that patient in front of you who presents with a hernia? Can ultrasound be helpful in any way in determining whether that hernia is stuck and whether it's possibly losing blood flow and whether this is a surgical emergency versus send the patient home and have them follow up with the surgeon because those are two very different things, right? Um, And that's where I think, that's where I think at least in my practice, ultrasound is the most useful. So let's talk about a few of the different findings for incarceration, right? Um, The first one is a thickened bowel wall. So it should make sense that the longer the bowel gets stuck there, it's going to get irritated. The bowel wall is going to get thickened. So if you had to throw a number out there, Jacob, for a thickened bowel wall, what would you, what would you, what would you assume that is? I don't know, like 
four millimeters. I don't that's, know. That's I'm pretty just, like, close, man. That's good. Yeah, I like that. It's three. Three is the number. Um, so, three, so three or more or greater than three? Uh, oh, that, you're asking that's me funny. if it's greater than or equal to or greater than? <laughs> it's because it's one one millimeter. You know, it's I'm a gonna big, I'm big good, distance. Yeah, it's, it's a big difference. It's actually it could be less than it could be a nanometer. It could be <laughs> <laughs> one nanometer greater than three or three. Uh, I, I would say three or greater than. Uh, I'm going to go with the increased sensitivity here. So I like uh, it. greater than or equal to three millimeters of your bowel wall, that's going to be concerning. So here we've got a, a patient who had a, um, this was in fact an incarcerated inguinal hernia. This was a direct uh, inguinal hernia, the patient that I had. And um, they had a, what I presume to be a thickened bowel wall here. So you see the hernia sac, right? It's important yeah. to remember the hernia sac often has fluid in it, especially in these incarcerated patients. So the bowel will be the structure inside of the hernia sac. And we're really superficial here. We're only a couple couple millimeters under the skin. This guy was this guy was uh, in a lot of pain. Um, this area was very tender. So there's really light pressure with the probe, but we were able to see a, a pretty thickened bowel wall. All right, so another thing we're going to look for, Jacob, is fluid in the herniated bowel. So this is fluid actually inside the bowel itself. And I think this kind of goes along with this whole idea of uh, increased edema, right? So thickening of the bowel wall, you're probably going to get some fluid that's kind of extruded into the actual bowel itself. That's more concerning for incarceration, okay? Next would be... Got it free fluid in the hernia sac and echogenic fat in that free fluid as well. So here, this is bowel. This is your bowel wall that we're getting in cross section. We've got fluid in the hernia sac, again, going along with that edema and then echogenic fat, which would suggest that there's some inflammation, which is irritating that fat. And this is probably, you know, uh, just a little bit of fat that's kind of like stringing off the bowel that's gotten a little more echogenic and thick and edematous because of the fact that you're dealing with string or incarcerated in this case, bowel, right? The other thing you can look for and that is suggestive of incarceration is uh, intra-abdominal bowel dilation. So just the presence of small bowel obstruction basically is what we're looking for here. So does the patient have a small bowel obstruction and a hernia? In, ca in that case, they most likely have incarceration of that hernia. Otherwise, they wouldn't have developed a small bowel obstruction from that hernia, right? So this is just sort of like deductive reasoning makes sense, but something that I've never really thought of as a possible indication that the hernia itself is incarcerated. So the real question for me, though, I mean, because incarceration is different, in my opinion, at least than strangulation. Like when I think strangulation, sure. I think dead bowel or going to be dead bowel okay. soon. Like I push this bowel in, patient gets sick, you know, has real bad outcome versus, you know, that's somebody you want to call the surgeon, have them take them to the operating room to resect some bowel probably, right? At least that's sort of how I've thought about it. So things that we find on ultrasound that suggest strangulation, um, are a little bit different than what we talked about with incarceration. So for, for strangulated bowel, there was actually this, this study that is very old um, from 1994. Jacob was born this year. Uh, actually, what year were you born? No, it was actually uh, 2004, <laughs> 14. <laughs> so old study, but really, honestly, this is the only thing I can find out there. If somebody else knows about something else, please shoot it my way. I'd be interested to see it. Um, this was um, from Japan and again, 1994 in the British Journal of Surgery. And this was looking at ultrasound for diagnosis of strangulation and small bowel obstruction. Um, and it's a fairly small study. There weren't that many patients. I think it was like 200 patients or so. Um, and uh, something like uh, 30 something patients had strangulation, which is not not a ton of patients, right? Uh, but what they found was that they there are some ultrasound findings that are consistent with strangulation of the bowel, uh, and those are an akinetic dilated loop and free fluid in the peritoneum, right? So akinetic dilated loop here we see at the top for ultrasonographic finds, sensitivity of 90%, specificity of 93%. Not bad, right? Small numbers, you know, 39 patients. Peritoneal fluid, 90% sensitivity. 51% specificity. Okay. So together those I think are probably pretty helpful, right? And it performed at least a lot better than physical signs and laboratory data, which, you know, to be honest, other, other than CT, I think I'm sort of stuck with physical exam findings and laboratory data and determining whether this patient's sick or not sick, right? Cause if you've got stuck bowel, it's at least incarcerated. The question is, is it strangulated? And if you're stuck with nothing but, you know, physical exam and laboratory studies, then your sensitivity and specificities are not going to be that great right? So ultrasound could, I think, benefit in some ways um, in these patients. So the two things we're going to look for are lack of peristalsis in that fluid, right? So here we've got an example of a patient with a, this was a strangulated hernia, right? There's no peristalsis in that hernia. You sit on it for a while, see if you see any poop flowing through it, see if you see the bowel squeezing down at all. 
don't see those things, that's concerning for, peris- for a lack of peristalsis, 90% sensitivity that that patient has strangulation. And then uh, the other thing that we've talked about, at least previously on the podcast, uh, and um, they mentioned briefly in this paper, but didn't actually study the data, is the lack of Doppler flow. So I had always sort of assumed that if there's no Doppler flow, um, or that if a patient has strangulation, there shouldn't be Doppler flow to that bowel. But I I think actually what we're, yeah, right, right. But I think what we're actually finding out is that um, that's a really late finding. So just like you can have um, testicular or ovarian torsion without, with, uh, in a patient who has Doppler flow, I think you can have the same thing. Uh, You can have strangulation of bowel and still have some Doppler flow. And <clears throat> let me let me break it down for you for a minute as to why I think this is happening. So I'm ready. I previously thought that basically if uh, you had bowel, right, that got stuck, right? So your bowel is um, uh, sticking out a little bit and maybe it squeezes out a little bit more, kind of gets stuck, right? Then all of a sudden, as it gets squeezed out a little bit more, that artery gets kind of cut off, right? And that causes the actual strangulation. So it's like arterial um, uh, uh, compression or twisting or something like that that causes the lack of blood flow to the bowel, which then kills the bowel. That was kind of always my assumption as to how strangulation worked, but I think it's actually different. I think what actually happens is the bowel gets kind of pushed out, right? It gets kind of, you know, squoezed down. And it's probably, I mean, if you think about it, uh, if the if the defect in the fascia is big enough that you can push bowel through it, it's probably not going to be so small that you're going to immediately cut down the arterial flow. But what you are going to do probably is compress that bowel some, right? So as it's sitting out there, it's going to compress, get a little bit more edematous. It's going to increase in size. That that arterial flow that's going to it is probably still working, but it's starting to get more edematous. And as it gets more edematous and thicker, it starts to basically occlude the artery so that you're no no longer getting flow to the bowel because of all the edema in the bowel itself. It's occluding the the arterial flow as well as the venous flow, right? So it's probably this like sort of prolonged process rather than like this acute event. So because of that, you can have strangulation for a long time and still have arterial or Doppler flow to that bowel, but you're already creating that event where you're getting edema, you're getting a thickened bowel wall, you're getting fluid inside the herniated bowel, and all of that increase in pressure is going to decrease the amount of you know arterial flow and or flow at all that you're getting to or from that bowel, and eventually, long, further down the road, you're going to get that lack of Doppler flow. So, I guess. What I've learned from, from doing the research just from, for this podcast and thinking about this a little bit more is that we probably should not be depending on arterial flow or Doppler flow to these, these um, hernias to determine whether they're strangulated or not. I think that we can probably uh, depend more on peristalsis, free fluid in the peritoneum, maybe if you see it, and then these other findings like thickened bowel wall, fluid in the hernia bowel, free fluid in the hernia sac, those are probably more concerning for strangulation or early strangulation. And Doppler flow. I mean, sure. Yeah, like, if you if you don't have any Doppler flow, that's would, probably like, dead bowel. Add, add to that, and I don't know if you were going to say this already, but um, I think if you add like a lactate and a CPK, like super crucial because if you have you know free fluid in that hernia wall, um, but you have a little bit of flow, but the lactate's like seven, um, that's probably strangulated, right? Probably, yeah. I mean, yeah. I think you still got to use your. Your, your typical clinical impression, right? I'm just talking about the ultrasound aspect, but I, I don't disagree with you whatsoever. Like somebody's got uh, good Doppler flow, but their lactate's elevated and their white count's 14 and they've got a fever and they're vomiting. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm worried that that thing's right. strangulated for sure. Yeah. Um, but um, I, I think in terms of using the ultrasound, um, we probably can't hang our hat on Doppler flow in these cases. We probably need to look for secondary signs of incarceration and strangulation. Well, crap. I like to hang my hat. Just to be clear, though, like we've said a thousand times, ultrasound is a tool. It gives you information. You still have to be a doctor and use your clinical judgment. But having this tool, looking directly at the bowel and integrating this information should make you a better clinician and improve your clinical judgment. Now, why was I not on this podcast video and instead just making random comments at the beginning and the end? Is it because I'm lazy? Yes. Are there other reasons also? Well, yes. Recently, I bought the castle where we have Castle Fest. The one issue we always have with Castle Fest is that we're never happy with the service we get from the castle. So we've been fixing that. 
I've been focusing all out on complete renovation of the castle. We're turning the 55 acres that it sits on into the world's greatest farm-to-table restaurant and boutique hotel. We've hired an amazing staff with a chef who literally cooks the most amazing food I've ever eaten. We have a master bourbon steward in residence, a full-time farmer, a butler, head server, events manager, a dozen concierge, and the list goes on. If you've never been to Castle Fest, this is the year to come. If you've been before, please check out the changes this year. We do only have a few spots left, but if you miss out, go to the new Castle website, thekentuckycastle.com, and just come stay with us sometime anyway. Tell them you're my friend, and I'll come out and give you a tour while you're here. Again, my apologies for being MIA in 2017, but I've been mildly obsessed with this project, and I'm super pumped to share it with you all this spring. If you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasound some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it. Yeah, we can definitely do that, or we could be better clinicians and use our ultrasound. <laughs>